Hi, everybody. My name is Marissa Axelrod. I'm the Director of Community Nursing for the Health and Wellness Department at The People Concern. And we're doing a training today called Itchy, 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 Ouch, um, to talk about scabies, lice, bed bugs, and staph, um, staph infection. So this is a really good training, which helps give real pictures of what these things look like and what to look for with our clients and also with us since we're out in the field and within our interim housing locations also. Um, if you have any questions, please just interrupt and unmute yourself and ask so that I can answer because it's really difficult when you're sharing your screen to see that kind of stuff. I will share my screen now. I'm gonna start this from the beginning and just wanna double check, can you guys see that? Okay, great. So this is, like I said, itchy, 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 ouch, scabies, lice, bed bugs, and staph. So first we're gonna talk about what scabies is. And on this, on this picture, there is a picture of flea bites and a picture of scabies. And you can see the scabies is a little bit more like waxy looking versus the flea bites. So they can be small like that. Sometimes in clients, we'll see a little bit of a bigger thing, but typically it's a small rash. Um, it's a contagious skin disease that's marked by itching and small red spots caused by the itch mite. The mites are small, eight-legged parasites that are just under a third of a millimeter. So that is really, really tiny and you cannot see them. And they're long and they burrow into the skin. So they dig their way into the skin. And it can take up to six weeks after the infection before the scabies symptoms appear. So again, once someone's been exposed to them, it can take four to six weeks before you actually start seeing the rash. Um, once they reach temperatures below 68 degrees, they're immobile, they stop moving, or prolonged exposure 10 minutes or more to hot, which is temperatures over 122 degrees, will kill the mites. And then they live off the host body for 24 to 36 hours. And human scabies has been reported for over 25 thousand years. So they've been around for a very long time. So this is the life cycle of scabies. So it starts with the egg. In two to three days, it becomes a larva. And then in three to four days, it goes to the nymph stage. And then another four to seven days, it goes to the adult female. And in one to two months, this is what it looks like when they're under the skin. They lay their eggs, they become all the way to an adult and they're underneath the skin. This is a scabies mite. This is the cartoon version, a scary cartoon version, but a cartoon version. So like I said, they are microscopic and they live under the skin. They are a cousin to arachnoids and such as scorpions and spiders. The, they dig into the flesh and then they eat their way through the skin cell and lay the eggs underneath the skin and this can cause itching, burning, and even open sores on its victim. The open sores that we see are usually because it itches so bad that our clients will itch and itch and itch until there's scratch marks also which then break down the skin. So what they do is, and I didn't preface this training by saying I apologize beforehand because you may itch during the training and some of this stuff is kind of gross looking, but super important that we know what to look for. Um, they dig in, they really, really, really dig in. And you can see that there's spikes on their back. So once they dig in, they don't look back. So as a burrowing creature, they look, come, they go in and they cannot back up. This is what they look like. Here is the spikes on their back. So Victims can have dozens, if not hundreds of these, living on and under their skin for months before they even notice. But sometimes, again, the itching gets so bad they notice. So by the time our clients come to us and they have the rash, they've already had them for, again, it could be up to six weeks before it starts to show up. And then by the time the itching and the rash really starts, it could be even longer than that. So once they've nestled between the layers of the skin, the female scabies lay up to three eggs a day, which then start that process that I showed you in the beginning. And they just keep 
going and going and going. Does anyone know where scabies like to live? What parts of the body? Anybody? Warm parts. Warm. Yeah, warm parts. So when a client shows you that they have a rash around their wristbands, around their waistbands, around their sock bands, um, in the center of their back, where it's nice and warm and sweaty, that's then where I start to go, hmm, interesting that they've got them in those places. Let me see what that rash looks like. And when it looks like those little red spots, I go, hmm, I think we need to get you to a doctor. This is maybe what this is, but I don't diagnose. Right? So scabies mites can also survive in the fabric of couches and chairs for weeks and make a new host out of someone who sits on them. That's scary. This is, let's talk, now I've officially scared everybody. <laughs> let's talk about how it's spread and how it's not spread. Um, Sergio, can you read how it's spread? Uh, yes. Um, so the way scabies spread is to through direct prolonged skin-to-skin -skin contact, close person-to-person -person contact of the skin-to-skin -skin variety, sexual, sexual physical contact, sharing clothes, bedding, or towels of an infected person, and lastly, possible through massage. Exactly. So as much as I just scared everybody, again, this whole training, there's a lot of, there's a lot, and I think it's scary. This is close person-to-person -person contact. Right, so skin to skin. So this is laying down with somebody, cuddling with somebody. This is sharing clothes or bedding. So someone's sharing their sleeping bag or they're giving somebody their towel. Um, massage because you're in close contact and you're massaging someone. I will tell you a friend of mine was a massage therapist many, many years ago and ended up getting scabies from staying in a very nice hotel in Malibu because the hotel had them and they didn't wash their linens properly. And she had to go back six weeks from the time that she was diagnosed and tell all of her clients that she had scabies because it was in the warmth of her hands. So from massaging, she could have been passing it on to other people. So scary. Um, can somebody read how it's not spread? Yeah. Scabies is not spread by shaking hands or by hugging. It's not spread by hanging your coat next to an infected person's coat. <clears throat> it's not spread by being in close proximity to someone infected, such as case management services. It's not spread by visiting someone's home or having a meal with someone who's infected. Right, and I have the stars next to visiting someone's home because if you're gonna sit on their couch and hang out on their couch and their couch is infected with them, then, then that would be a reason why you could potentially get it, but just going to someone's home and seeing a client on a home visit, for the most part, we're not sitting on their furniture. Um, we typically aren't doing that just because the risk of scabies or bed bugs. Um, we're usually pretty like protective over where we're setting our stuff when we're doing home visits. Um, and like this says, even like hanging your coat next to an infected person's coat. So I know that there's been some concerns if somebody has scabies and they're sitting in the hard plastic chairs at our interim housing locations and somebody comes and sits in that chair behind after they've been in that chair, is there a risk of getting scabies that way? Yes or no? Anybody? I sure hope to God no. 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 I was gonna ask Marissa, so it looks like a lot of these, uh, the way it's spread is mostly through either getting in contact with the infected person or their items or anything they own. How do you originally get it? Is it from like an animal or? Where do you, like, where, where's like the start, you know, if it's not through a person? I wouldn't, I don't actually know the answer of like the root, but typically it's being spread from like someone who has it and their belongings to somebody else. Um, also, if you have poor hygiene, that can, that plays a role in it also, because if you're sharing something and then you're not bathing, because they die in, temp in temperatures greater than, right? I think it was 122. So if you're taking a warm shower, um, before they start the burrowing process. Um, but it's pretty quick once they start the burrowing process. And again, it's close contact with somebody's items that already have it. So if you are not coming in contact with somebody else's stuff that has it, you should be pretty good. Um, but we know that with our client population, a lot of people share. 
um, or they'll find clothes laying on the sidewalk or maybe a towel or a sleeping bag or a blanket and they'll just pick it up and use it and that can be and that's a lot of how it's transmitted. So how is it diagnosed? So diagnosis is usually just a visual diagnosis by looking at the rash or a doctor can do a little skin scraping where they scrape the skin and look under a microscope. Because again, it's microscopic. So you have to look under a microscope to see if there's mites and or the eggs. So you can see in this picture, this is like a hair. This is how tiny it is. And you can see the shape of the body looks very similar to that photo that I showed you earlier. And this is how we're gonna look at what the differences are between scabies and lice and bed bugs is they all look very different and very uniquely different. And again, even with scabies, we're not gonna see the actual scabies. We're not gonna be able to see that. Anybody wanna read? Can somebody read how they get treated if you have scabies? Treatment can be topical cream applied at night from the neck down that's left on the body for eight to 12 hours and then washed off, typically 5% promethium cream and to treat symptoms possibly an antihistamine for itching and steroid cream for swelling. If severe cases, crusted scabies, I have no idea how to say that. I'm sorry. We'll okay. use. E -O ivermectin. So uh, ivermectin is a prescription pill um, that the doctor can provide. So anytime that you suspect that someone has scabies or someone tells you, I think I may have scabies, you wanna get them to one of the providers that we work with or their providers so they can get the permethrin cream. The cream is gonna go on their body from their neck down. They're gonna keep it on for eight to 12 hours and they're gonna wash it off the next morning. During that time, when they go to wash it off, you wanna get rid of all their clothes and their bedding needs to be switched out also. So all new clothes that have been washed and dried on hot, 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 you wanna dry everything on hot, and all of their bedding needs to be taken, bagged, and they need to be given all new bedding. All of their other clothes that they have should also be washed on hot, 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 and dried on hot, hot, hot. Okay, so that's, that's gonna be the typical way that we wanna treat people. Most times nowadays, especially for the last few years that I have seen is that the permethrin treatment, that a lot of the scabies is resistant to permethrin treatment or our clients don't put it on properly, which is you have to get your neck down, which includes your back, which is a really hard area for a lot of people to get. Um, and in that case, we've been just treating people with the cream and then also giving them the ivermectin at the same time. The ivermectin, depending on the dose, is they take their first dose. A week later, they take their second dose, which is another pill or two. And then on the third week, they take another dose. So they take it weekly. They don't take it daily. It's taken weekly for three weeks. And that really gets in and, and kills the scabies. What can you do to protect yourself? The only way to protect yourself is to make sure that you do not come in that direct close contact. Again, this is close contact with somebody who's infested. This is a difficult task to achieve um, because a lot of times you don't know that scabies is present and it takes again, the four to six weeks before it shows up. So I used that example of the friend of mine who stayed at the hotel in, again, really nice hotel in Malibu. They had no idea that there was scabies in the room that they were staying in um, and didn't know until a few weeks later when they traced it back, that was the only place they could have gotten it. What they had to do in their house, so this is if you're working with a client who's housed, is there's, there's exterminators that can come in obviously and heat treat the whole unit. Um, they ended up having to bag up a lot of their stuff. They lived in the valley, it was summertime. So they were able to put a bunch of their stuff into black trash bags um, and leave it outside in the sun. Another technique, we had a client, this is a while ago where I had a client who lived in their car um, and had scabies and so, and they had cloth interior seats. So what we had them do is we actually had them take their car and go park their car again. It was warm summertime. We had them go take their car and park it in the valley with all the windows up for um, an extended period of time. I don't remember how many, I think we had them do it for, I think it was three days we had them park their car that way. And then we paid for a hotel for them to be treated while they were in the hotel. But we had them park their car there to make sure that the, the temperature in the valley with the windows up in their car was enough to actually kill everything within their car. Um, 
You can avoid spreading scabies by going under treatment as soon as possible. And individuals in institutional settings, such as prisons, nursing homes, daycares, homeless shelters, should be checked regularly as they may not exhibit extreme symptoms or may be unable to verbalize their symptoms. Does anybody have any questions about scabies? I do, Marissa. Yeah. If we're looking and trying to identify, especially with the population we work with, a rash, are we also looking just for scratch marks? Because especially the people that we work with, I mean, if you're scratching for whatever reason, you're out on the street, you can distort that rash, I imagine, right? So, so what, are we, what else are we looking for? Yeah, so the scratch marks are a really good indicator. Again, you wanna look at what those areas are, the warm areas. So the wristbands, um, even the crooks of the elbows, the waistband is a really good indicator. That small of the back or the center of the back, um, ankle, like sock bands, um, areas like that is really. So if somebody says that I have a rash, you go, oh, where's the rash? Like, oh, it's around my waistband and on my wrists. That's for me, a number one indicator that my first thought is gonna be, this may be scabies. Okay, let's talk about lice. Okay, there's a bunch of different kinds of lice. And sorry again, the pictures, they're gross. They're disgusting. But now we get to learn to identify what lice looks like, which we can actually see. And lice can infect like, the head, the body, the pubic area, and they feed on human blood. They lay their eggs and they leave waste product on the skin and in clothing and they crawl, but they do not fly, hop, or jump. Okay, they do not fly, hop, or jump, they crawl. This is where I just got a little itchy on my neck, you guys. So this is the different stages of lice and I'll show you the stage flyer in a second, but this shows them from when they're little and then as they grow and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So they're parasitic insects that feed on the human blood. Who can read to me about head lice? Anybody? Head lice are parasites that are found on human heads. The word lice is plural for louse. The common head louse is an insect which attaches itself to the scalp and feeds off of human blood. Lice lay eggs on the shafts of the hair. And often it is these small white nits that are the first indication of infestation. Exactly, I will ask this question that nobody probably wants to answer, but who has dealt with head lice, especially as a child? I think most of us have, or if you have kids, you may have dealt with that at home also. Lice nowadays are tricky. They have people who their whole entire career is the lice lady or the lice man, and they come and they come to your house to help de-louse your kids, um, which is really, really interesting. So uh, body lice, can somebody read body lice for me? Any volunteers? I'll just keep going. Lice that are found on the body are different from lice found on the head or around the pubic area. The body louse is larger than other types of lice. Body lice are, are particularly prevalent where hygiene is poor. It can transmit several diseases through its bite, including typhus. Infestations occur worldwide and are spread via close person-to-person -person contact or through used bed, linens, towels, and clothing. In general, infestations of body lice are, are limited to people who live in unhygienic or crowded conditions and who do not have access to clean clothing. All right, so body lice, you can see. Head lice, you can see when you look really closely because you can see those little white nits. And then they have the combs that you can use, which really like grab the lice off the hair shaft and you can look on the comb. Um, but with body lice, you can talk to someone and see the lice crawling on them. Um, and being in an uncrowded, being in a crowded, unhygienic situation really, I mean, I hate saying it like this, but really a lot of our clients live in settings like that. Um, and again, with this one, it's close person to person contact, meaning you're like right next to them. 
Um, but it's not that the same with sc scabies is like skin to skin, like really, really close, close direct contact. Body lice is not as close, like you're still around the person, um, still if you're sharing anything with them, but it's also the body lice treatment is really like, let's get you take, let's get a shower and let's get you some clean clothing. But we'll get to that. So this is what the cartoon version of the human lice, at least I start with the human, well, I kind of start with the human version because there was the other pictures. They like to drink your blood. Like twice a day, they climb down from their hair, they go to where their host blood is, and they stick this sharp tube-like mouth part through your skin and they suck your blood. And they cause, when they feed, they inject some of their saliva into the host so the host blood doesn't clot. And the bite is painless, but it's the saliva that causes the itching a few hours after the insect is fed. So, blood sucking. They like to suck your blood. They live in the human hair, right? So it's the head lice, um, body lice, so on the body and other areas. And then there's a crab lice, which is what's in the pubic area. This is a really interesting fact that in with the changes in like pubic hair over the years, um, that the pubic lice is actually extremely uncommon now versus in the 70s when there were bushier pubic areas versus now where people are much more um, like shaved or less hair in the pubic area. And so you don't actually see pubic lice as much anymore with the fact that many women and men actually shave their pubic hair or keep it much cleaner now than in like the 70s and 80s. Lice like people because our blood keeps them well fed. Okay. Whew. Lice is, here's the different pictures on the bottom of what they look like. So head lice and body lice are the most easily identifiable. So you can see they're a bit longer and narrower than the crab lice, which actually looks like little mini crabs. And then the picture on the far right at the bottom is the one that like, that's what the nits look like. And human lice die really fast. They die within 24 hours if they aren't attached to a host. So if we find lice on someone's bedding and we package that up and put it in a black trash bag so it can go to the company that cleans everything, within 24 hours, they're gonna start to die off because they're not attached and they're not getting fed and they need to get fed. So they like to crawl around. Um, they like to hold on to things. They grip really well. And females lay anywhere from three to 10 eggs a day and the eggs hatch within 10 days. So after 10 more days and the new lice are ready to mate and the cycle starts again. So here is the life cycle. So you go from the eggs to the larva, to the second stage of the larva, to the third stage, and then up to an adult. And then it shows on the right side, the different stages of the first, second, third stages of the lymph, and then the male, and then the female. So they're a little different shaped, but to the, to the eye, you wouldn't notice maybe the difference between the male and the female. So how is head lice spread? So direct contact. They, again, they cannot jump or fly and therefore depend upon direct or indirect head-to-head -head contact. So I tell this story a lot. We have a client who I've known for 20 years. He is someone who, what I say, likes to head connect with me. So, you know, we don't really hug our clients, but when he sees me, he really likes to go like this and tap me and put his head against my head. He is not someone has, who has really good hygiene and doesn't typically shower very often. And if he does, I don't think he ever washes his hair. It is really challenging because to head connect with somebody and have your head against them, that is how you would get head lice. Um, lice can survive for short periods of time on clothing, hats, and hairbrushes. So can often be involved in the spread of infestations, but again, without a host for 24 hours, they will start to die off. 
Headlights are spread by common personal contact with sharing these things. Hats, you know, people will share hats when clothing donation comes in. Again, this is a, they start to die off after 24 hours. So if people are sharing stuff in a shorter period of time. How is body lice spread? Can somebody read this one for me? Infestations are generally spread by close contact with other people and are typically found in areas of poor hygiene and crowding. Other animals or pets like dogs and cats do not play a role in spreading human lice. Humans are the bloody louses only host and lice will die within five to seven days if they fall off a person. So this picture is a very good indicator of what they look like. And this is exactly the picture of what you will see crawling on your clients. Um, very easy to identify when somebody has body lice. This is, you will see it crawling on their shirt. Most places that you will see them, when doctors examine our clients, they will pull their shirt back like this. And this is where you will see them crawling. I mean, they're also in other areas, but this is a very good indicator right there, because this is how our providers check. And again, this is exactly what they look like. This is what head lice knits look like. So up close, again, if you have kids that you've gone through this with, or you've had them yourself, this is what it looks like up close. And you can see that they are seeable to the human eye because we can see hair strands at this size, right? Okay, diagnosis and treatment. So like I said, they are visible to the naked eye. They cause itching. Some individuals are asymptomatic, but you know, again, if you've seen somebody with head lice, they will be itching. They will be itching. Keep in mind that although the only reliable sign of an infestation is the presence of a live louse or nymph, the presence of nits may also be a sign that there is or has been an active infestation. And some people can be allergic, which means they'll have more inflammation present. To treat, you wanna check all other household residents or those in close contact, contact with the infected individual. So there's over-the-counter topical lice treatments that use permethrin or permethrin-based medical therapy, such as NYX or RID, which can be bought at the local store. You do not need a prescription for NYX or RID. Um, that is the shampoo that you use, and it usually comes with the comb to comb through. If someone has head lights, we, we can get them the NYX or the RID. Um, we can also have them see their provider, but in the immediate, we can get them the NYX or RID. And then we have to make sure that they're following the directions. If they're not someone who can read the directions and follow them as is, then we wanna make sure that our support staff is really working with them to make sure that they're utilizing that, the shampoos correctly. And then also helping with getting clean bedding, washing and drying all their clothes. And if they, depending on the facility that they're in, if they're in one of the IH sites, checking their bin to see if they've got clothes in there and if the clothes are infest, infested or also check looking in their lockers to see the same thing. We've had clients where I opened up their bin and everything and it was just saturated with body lice. And again, body lice is a pretty easy, just is a pretty easy treatment is we really just wanna wash so this was the head lice. I love this little cartoon. May I say that your parasites are especially delicious this evening as they pick them off the grill us. So this is body lice on clothing. This is pretty, pretty close looking. Again, it's, you know, I have some better pictures that I should put, should put in there for next time where you can actually like really see the shape of what I showed you guys, like where it really looks just like this on the bedding. So for body lice, I survive lice, right? This is a really good thing. Again, body lice is looked at, you typically look. You can, you can bring back the, the, sh the collar of the shirt and look. You can see them crawling around. They're big enough to see with the naked eye. There's the knits that are usually in the seam of the clothing. And treatment is improving personal hygiene, regular changing of clothes, washing clothes, 
you want to, again, this is hot, hot, hot. So you want to wash in hot, you want to dry in hot, as hot as, as the washing machine or dryer will allow. And then medicines that are killed lice called pediculicides may be used to treat body lice infections, infestations. Um, a lot of times our providers, if someone is showing that they have lice, will also give them the permethrin cream to put on, which is the leave on eight to 12 hours overnight and then wash off in the morning as a preventative method, just in case. But again, typically washing all your stuff with for body lice will take care of it and then having better hygiene moving forward. Okay, what can you do to protect yourself? Head lice, it's next to impossible to prevent all head lice infections. That's why it runs through schools rampant. Um, and especially if one of your family members gets it, the whole home should be treated. That's, that gets really challenging. Body lice, like I've said over and over again, personal hygiene, personal hygiene, personal hygiene. Showering, clean clothes. Do not share clothes. And if you find body lice, everything should be laundered and hot. And any family members or those that share the living space should also be treated if they want to be. Okay, any questions about head lice, body lice? Yes, I do uh, for the treatment. Um, so in my experience, um, many of the medical does not cover those treatments. So uh, in the past, we used to uh, purchase those treatments for the clients because they were not covered. I don't know if it all depends on their medical coverage. Do you know oh. anything? Yeah, so permethrin should be, the permethrin cream is covered by Medi-Cal. The pills, the ivermectin, which is used for scabies, was formerly not covered. Sometimes it is covered, but if not, then GoodRx. You can also get it using GoodRx, and I think it's $20 now versus like the 80 that it used to be. Um, so we just went through this at one of our IH sites, so we were getting a few people treat it right now. Um, and then in terms of NICs, NICs you can usually get, sometimes even 99 cent store has NICs or you can buy it at any of the CVS, Rite Aids, Walgreens, any kind of drugstore like that. Um, I don't know if you can get the NICs um, or RID through insurance because it's an over-the-counter. Sometimes like our provider on the West Side, Venice Family Clinic, they'll have it and they can provide it to our clients. Um, but that, mo that really expensive one is that ivermectin pill and you can get it now. If you can't get it through the insurance, then you can do it through GoodRx and, it, and it's much cheaper. And we would much rather someone get the treatment, especially if they're in our IH site, than not. And if it's a small cost like that and there's not, it's not in the budget, then I will say this is that, is that talk to your supervisor, talk to the director of that IH site and, and it will get covered. We'll figure out how to get it covered. Any other questions on lice? Marissa, are, are substance use treatment centers or, or interim housing sites, et cetera, taking clients that currently have things like lice or scabies? I understand there's treatment once they have it, but or can, can our clients go and see a physician at the Bennis Family Clinic, for instance, for their collarbone or for a cough if they're being treated for scabies or lice currently? Absolutely. Yeah, because it's not spread that way. And this is something, I mean, in our community, this is something that we see daily. And it's not something that we want to create stigma about for our clients. Um, so like I said, right now at one of our interim housing sites, we have several people that have shown up with scabies and lice. I do not think that they're directly related to each other. They're not people that hang out with each other. I think they're actually all ten are isolated, isolated. And there's no reason why we wouldn't have them stay in our facility. Um, because it's not really spread that way, right? Like we, what needed to happen is everyone needed to take a shower. Everyone needed to put the cream on them, get all their clothes washed and new linens. And then for those that had the potential scabies, get the prescription for the ivermectin. Um, for me as a healthcare provider, like not a huge deal. Um, like I don't see it as an outbreak level and that we need to create any type of hysteria but definitely went into the facility so we could do some education with everyone on if you're experiencing these symptoms just in case. Um, because where did they, where did it come from? 
you know, and that that's kind of the question. But where everybody's beds are located, no one is near each other, and it's spread by close contact. Um, so it wouldn't make sense that any of them actually got it from each other. Just happened to be a time. And when it starts to warm up a little bit, we start to see a little bit more cases. Um, we just start to see some more cases. Okay, so let's talk bed bugs. So looking at this picture of a bed bug, this looks very, very different than what body lice looks like, correct? So these are round, brown, but the body shape is more round than the lice, which is longer. So initially, when we just had our, you know, the clients at one of our H sites, they were like, there's bed bugs there. And I went and I was like, these aren't bed bugs. Totally, totally different looking. Also, normally when we see bed bugs, not to say that it doesn't, that it, that this doesn't always happen, but normally we see bed the edges of the beds. And one thing that I'll do is I'll go and I'll pull sheets back really quick because bed bugs like really dark places. So if we pull sheets back really quickly, if there's bed bugs there, we'll typically see them crawling around or looking on the edge of beds. Now in our IH sites, we cover all of our beds with bed bug covers. So there aren't the edges of the beds to actually look at. They can't get into the mattresses anymore because we have the precautions on that on all of our IH beds. So what bed bugs are is they are also blood sucking. They are a parasite of birds and mammals. They're small oval brownish insects that live on the blood of other animals. And they have very flat bodies and they're about the size of an apple seed. And after feeding, their bodies will get bigger and bigger and bigger and turn kind of a reddish color because it's blood that's inside of them. Disgusting. So when I first started working at our agency and got introduced to really like what bed bugs are and what they're about, my first thing was, do they, since they have blood inside of them and they bite multiple people, can they transmit different viruses and infections that are blood to blood contact? And all the research that I did said no. Okay. So I researched that and researched that. So something like HIV or hep C. Um, or hepatitis B that is spread blood to blood contact is since there's blood inside the bed bug, can it transfer that disease to somebody else? And again, all the research I did was found no. Here's the cartoon version of the bed bug. Scariest looking one of them all, in my opinion. They've got this needle mouth that is this fleshy tube with a thin hollow needle that fits inside of it and they inject it into the skin and they slurp blood through this needle nose mouth. Disgusting. They like dark. I said they like dark. So they come out at night. They are like little tiny vampires and they feed on the victims while they sleep. One indicator that we see, which is really a good indicator is if you look at someone's bed or their pillowcase, you may see little blood spots because that's from the clients will, while they're sleeping, because it hurts when they get bit, maybe hitting things. And then the bed bugs will explode. And since they're filled with blood, it leaves blood spots. Scary. So there could be hundreds of bed bugs drinking out humans blood when there's an infestation of them. And they've been around for thousands and thousands of years. Their lifespan is up to 18 months. And their habitat is anywhere that people live. Scary. So I actually really love this picture that's in the upper left-hand corner. Actually, the one on the bottom too. But the one in the upper left-hand corner, you can really see how small it is on a person's body. And they just kind of walk around the person at night while they're sleeping. And they make their homes in these cool, dark places. And then they feed in the middle of the night. If the bed bug hasn't eaten for a long time, it will be very flat and thin. But once they come out, and so they can fit through like cracks and walls and go even under and behind wallpaper. And once they eat, then they start getting fatter and fatter and thicker and thicker. So when I say that they can crawl up behind walls, like in wallpaper, 
that's a really small spot wallpaper up against the wall. So even like baseboards, um, one of our facilities used to have baseboards in it. We pulled the baseboards off because we didn't want to have a place for bed, bed bugs to live. Right. And these were like the small little things that we started to look at at our facilities and say, okay, this is a breeding ground. We want, we don't want breeding grounds. So we really started investing in a lot of research on bed bugs and making sure that we were creating environments that were not conducive to having bed bugs. I have to say our facilities are really, really good at our bed bug control. This is also really strange fact. They have a gland on the underside of their body that secretes an oily discharge that has a faint smell of raspberries. Weird. So here is the life cycle of the bed bugs. Bed bugs take three to five minutes every time they eat, just so you know. So we go from an egg, all the different stages of being a larva, all the way up to an adult. And they can lay up to five eggs a day continuously. And again, how long is their life cycle? About 18 months. So how do we get them? Somebody read this for me. Anybody? Bed bugs may enter your home undetected through luggage, clothing, used, used beds and couches, and other items such as crevices of shoes. Their flattened bodies make it possible for them to fit into tiny spaces about the width of a credit card. Bed bugs do not have nests like ants or bees, but tend to live in groups in hiding places. Their initial hiding places are typically in mattresses, box springs, bed frames, headboards, and baseboards where they have easy access to people to bite in the night. Gross. So, <laughs> this is why as an agency, like we don't accept donated couches anymore, donated beds. Because once bed bugs really became rampant in, like in the US really, we had to, as a service provider, we had to stop allowing things like this to be donated. Um, it's also like not recommended that you buy used couches or bedding from people because you just don't know. Um, anytime I travel and go to a hotel, the first thing I do is I pull back that sheet. I look really quick and then I actually check the seams of the bed because most hotels, even really nice ones, don't have bed bug covers on their mattresses. They just have the sheet that covers it. So I always check, always, always, always check when I'm traveling. Um, it's really interesting because hotel policy, if you do find a bed bug within your room, they actually will empty out all the rooms around that room and then and move everybody and then take care of all the rooms around the one room that actually where a bed bug was found. So I've seen that happen. And again, they start off flat and then as they eat, they get fatter and fatter. So like I said, they mainly are active at night. They pierce the skin with their elongated beak in a sense. They eat about eight to 10 minutes at a time. Most of the bed bug bites are painless at first, but later turn into itchy welts. Sometimes they'll look like flea bites because that's what the areas are that are exposed on your body while you're sleeping. The bites do not have a red center in them like flea bites do. So some people, the bed bug bite, I think, uh, do I have a picture? Yeah, so I'll get to that one. So if you wake up itchy and you didn't, that you didn't have when you went to sleep, you may have bed bugs. This is a really good picture of how small it is within that seam of the bed. So I look really closely. And again, those blood stain, stains on the pillows or sheets, um, dark or rusty spots on mattresses or walls, um, looking for shells or the shed skins. There can be a musty odor from their scent glands. And then this is kind of what the bites typically look like. So again, for me, the diagnosis of this, even though as an RN, I do not diagnose, is I can see the bites. When I see these bigger ones like this, what I've seen in clients is they can range from something a little smaller than this to something even a little bit bigger than this, but they are typically welts. And then I will check the person's bed also to see if there's any indications on their bed. Again, those blood spot spots is a really good indication. But you also want to check because if the client has a rash that they've been scratching, that can also just be blood on the bed. 
So this is a lot of different ways to treat it. Hire an expert. Diatomaceous earth will actually is a phenomenal treatment. So diatomaceous earth with the type of bug that a um, bed bug is, if they walk over diatomaceous earth, it's like glass for their shell and it literally will kill them. Um, there's a bunch of different insects that, that the diatomaceous earth does that too. Um, there are different kinds of diatomaceous earth. One of them is a human grade one. So if you're going to use diatomaceous earth, you want to make sure that you're using the human grade version, okay? Um, temperatures above 120 degrees for about one minute. So that's the same temperature for scabies. Scabies? Well, I can't remember now. Um, and then getting rid of bed bugs is a very long process. You want to definitely clean everything. You, everything needs to be done in hot, hot, hot. You want to scrub mattresses or remove, get rid of the mattress and get a new one. Vacuum your bed. You want to use the diatomaceous earth. Bed bugs can live for a very long time without feeding. So remember that 18 month life cycle? Um, I have bed bug covers on all the mattresses in my house, just as a preventative measure, just in case. And you wanna keep no clutter around. They really, like I said, they really love like beds though. So any cracks and plaster, you wanna make sure that that's all taken care of in your house. Any questions about this stuff? I have a question. Uh, Marissa, I heard uh, um, on the library in my where I live, they said that there could be bed bugs on the books. Are they, is there something? Yeah, so we have, how I said, like at our interim housing locations, like we went around and made a determination of things that we could do around our facilities to make them safer. Um, one of the things was pull off the, the um, I just forgot the word, but pull off the, the, on the ground, right? The, I can't remember what this was called. I said it earlier. Um, and one of the other things was we had a library of books. And this was many, many years ago where we had, we had bed bugs in our facilities. Again, my, what we as an agency do is phenomenal. I have not seen bed bugs in our facilities in years. Um, and at that time we had a library and we ended up having to get rid of it. Um, we also had couches in some of our facilities at the time and we had to get rid of the couches. Um, like in our sojourn facility, we have like these soft, I want to say plastic, but these soft plastic like furniture, which is, is not a couch couch to sit on, but definitely like there are couches, but they're just wipeable surfaces and don't have any crevices. Um, and so that's the type of furniture that you can have for clients, as well as like the chairs that we use in, in our dining area. Um, so we really wanted to get rid of anything that would potentially allow for bed bugs to live in. So what you can do to protect yourself, it's actually really funny myself and one of the other staff, well, and some of the other staff, we used to have what we called the bed bug dance. So before we got into our cars, we would do the bed bug dance, which was basically like the running man. Um, just because we didn't want to transport any bed bugs when we traveled that were like the hitchhikers. Um, when I travel and I'm on an airplane, that also um, is an opportunity for them to hitchhike. So you really want to like check your luggage after you get it before you're bringing it into your house or spray it down. Um, another place, movie theaters are also a really good place for hitchhikers to, to grab hold of you. And then you wanna make sure that within our facilities and with our clients that they know what our bed bug plan looks like, right? So that everyone is being protective. That's why we really work with our clients on clutter management and hoarding. If somebody does have an infestation, you don't wanna sit on their beds, you don't wanna lean against their walls, you don't want cross-contamination to occur from one non-infested location to an another from an infested location to another um and then change of clothes or ceiling suspected work clothing if you're working in a facility that that has an outbreak at the time um again there were times working in our field where i would come home i would go into the backyard and i would take my clothes off and they would go straight into a plastic bag and they would stay there 
um, until it was time for laundry. And I would not bring anything into the house that had been in my place of work when I worked in a facility that had bed bugs. And again, the bed bug shake, we would do, like I said, it's basically like the running man to make sure that we didn't have any hitchhikers on us. I have a question. question. Yeah. The, the car situation, the, the temperature in the car would work the same as KB's? Yeah, it, for bed bugs, it's about an hour. So, but windows up, hot valley sun. Um, it, in Santa Monica, west side, it's not hot. It doesn't get hot enough where the inside of the car would get you know, hot enough to actually kill anything except for like the several, the few days of the year where we really get warm, warm temperatures there. Um, but, but definitely like valley heat, things like that, where you're having temperatures that are in the high 90s, hundreds, and then the windows are up in the car. Not the person, but we are. But the car, you know, but the car is there. Any other questions on bed bugs? Okay, let's talk about staph. So staph is a bacterial skin infection. Um, so this is caused by bacteria. So we usually see this as an abscess, a boil, um, cellulitis. This is the the indicator that we usually see a lot of is this redness, redness or like a like a pussy wound. Um, localized staph infections get this accumulation of pus. They can be very tender, painful, swollen. And then there's something called MRSA, which is methicillin resistant staph aureus. And this is the kind that we see that's antibiotic resistant to a certain antibiotic that has to be treated a little differently. Um, staph infections, depending on what kind, can be treated topically, orally, or intravenous. And staph-related illness can range from mild and reoccurring to severe and potentially fatal because you can become um, septic, which means the infection's through your whole body and it can actually kill people. This is examples of what staph looks like when we're looking at those abscesses. Okay, so if we see this on someone and they'll be like, oh, it's a spider bite. We wanna get them treated. We want them to have this looked at. If you look at this bottom picture, you can see the pen mark that's drawn around the red area. This is a really good thing to have a client do is you draw with a pen just around the red and if it gets worse in the next few hours, the next day, they have to see a doctor, have to. So staph is colonized and lives in our nose and on the skin of around 25 to 30% of healthy adults. Um, it is, in a majority of cases, it doesn't really cause a disease. However, if there's a break in skin, your immune system's a little depressed for some reason, it can become one of those abscesses. So this is what I tell people. If you are someone who shaves and you get a little bump, you kind of want to watch it to make sure that it doesn't become an abscess. If you do get something like a spider bite, you want to watch it and make sure. If you do get a cut, you want to watch it and make sure it's not getting worse in its redness or warmth. So MRSA is community, in the community is associated with the antibiotic resistance. Um, sometimes they're superficial infections, but again, they can become life-threatening and go into a bone infection and blood infection. MRSA is largely transmitted from people with active skin infections. So a lot of our clients tend to have skin infections and they ooze, and that ooze can get on somebody else but it has to be direct physical contact and it's not through the air. So it's spread through through touching surfaces. So if I have a big oozy wound and I just touched it and then I put my hand on a on the counter and then one of you comes right behind me and touches that area and you happen to have an opening there, you potentially just got MRSA. So I had a roommate once who he ended up with a staph infection on the back of his leg. And on here, it says sports equipment. He got it from being at the gym and he was wearing shorts at the gym. And somebody else must have been on the equipment before him. So again, it can be colonized in the nose and it stays here. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get an infection. It just kind of lives here. Who is at risk? So we are all at risk because we live, we live, we work in congregate settings. Hospital workers, homeless, incarcerated, 
frequent hospital users, if you live in congregate settings, people with a weakened immune system, and those in direct contact with an infected sore, wound, or personal hygiene equipment. How it's spread. So again, we just talked about that. One wound weeping to another opening. So if you look at this picture with all the red areas, this is all areas where staff could be present. It's kind of like one of the things they talk about. Oh, I just had it sitting here, but now it's from here. Like stethoscopes. It's one of the most popular things in a hospital that have staff on it. I was gonna say, I actually, like most popular thing in a hospital that has it because where do doctors and nurses wear their stethoscope? Right here. How often do they wash it? Not often, you guys but it should be washed daily. So it can be diagnosed by appearance. However, a little bit more infection, they may actually draw a blood test or do a culture of the wound. Treatment can be antibiotics, triple antibiotic ointment. Um, Bactrim is one of the antibiotics that's used most commonly. If it is an abscess, sometimes it needs to be surgically opened and drained and then have packing done on it once to twice a day. If it's more serious and life-threatening, someone may have to be hospitalized and be given life, um, be given IV antibiotics for a certain period of time. Sometimes this time frame can be a week. Sometimes this time frame could even be six weeks, depending on how bad the infection is. <clears throat> what you can do, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Avoid close skin contact with infected individuals. And anytime you have a cut or skin breakdown, make sure you wash it, keep it clean and dry and covered, and make sure you're cleaning your workspace. And again, hand washing. Because of the pandemic and COVID right now, most people are washing and cleaning their workstations regularly. So it's really decreasing on what I've seen in terms of our staff infected wounds. Wash your hands with warm water, use soap, scrub, dry, rinse. So there is row, row, row your boat, right? I'm not gonna do it all right now, but you wanna make sure you do your wrists, your wrists in between your fingers, you do your nails, you do your nails. One last rinse into the sink. This is an example of a 24 year old who put his hand down. This is the difference between hand washing and not hand washing when it actually is culture. You can see the MRSA that's grown in the Petri dish versus somebody who washed their hands. Any questions? I have one more. Yeah. So, so when you said that uh, if you touch a surface after um, a wound, you know, a leaky wound, um, not only if you have a, a cut, but also if you touch like your eye, like you scratch your eye or something like that is like, that's contaminating also? Yeah, it can be. It absolutely can be. I mean, anytime that you're introducing any type of infection into your body. So this is your mucous membrane, your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. And then also any wounds would be some type of opening. So you want to be careful that you're not getting anything into your eyes, nose, mouth, into an open wound. Um, just in general. Again, I think with the pandemic, it's really helped teach us um, a lot more about hand washing and cleaning our workspaces. Any other questions? I know we're just hit our hour mark. Yes. 